Welcome to Global Village TV show with Show Cable today. Today is the beginning of Global Village TV show with Cable Show. And this will be a weekly TV show where you will be able to watch uh, cultural events, different cultures from around the world, uh, interviews with politicians, education, uh, investment, uh, and other issues. Today we have a great two guests, uh, our great mayor, Martin Shields from Brooks, and our great MP, Mr. Lavar Payne, who, been, who became the first uh, guest that we invited. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Ahmed. Mr. Lavar, uh, as you very well known that we have um, economic slowdown in the whole wide world. Uh, have we been affected that slowdown, you think? Well, there's great potential for that to happen, Ahmed. Uh, uh, with the slowdown in the world, that will affect economies right across the globe. And certainly our biggest customer is the United States. Uh, however, we do uh, trade with other countries around the globe. So potentially, if they're not buying our goods, that will have a, an impact on, on Canada. Okay, yeah, as you mentioned now, uh, the U.S. is our great, our largest partner with uh, uh, around the world. Excel pipeline uh, has been rejected just two days ago, as you know. Do you think the government uh, would have alternative or what plan is do we have for that Excel pipeline which would benefit the Canadians as well? Well, certainly the Excel pipeline is disappointing that it's not going ahead uh, as planned, uh, right now anyway. Um, I understand that potentially uh, after the November election uh, in 2012 that uh, there's likely that will go ahead. However, um, it is disappointing at this point in time. Uh, the government of Alberta is also looking at the Gateway Project, um, which in turn we want to sell our oil from the oil sands to China and Asian countries. So that's also uh, on the board and there are hearings going on right now uh, on that Gateway as well. Well, that's uh, good news too, uh, um, for that uh, Plan B. The opening of the 24 hours uh, cross uh, border cross in our, in our area. Uh, where are we at that one? Well, that one's still a work in progress. Um, you may or may not be aware that my predecessor, Monty Solberg, was working on that uh, back in 06, 07, and of course that uh, is a long-term project. Uh, uh, our Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, along with President Obama, came to uh, sign an agreement to certainly make things easier and better for trade north and south of the border as well as visitors and I am hopeful that uh, through that process uh, that will also help uh, open up the uh, the border at Wild Horse. Uh, I've made some, uh, I've written some letters to the ministers, to various ministers on that whole issue and um, I'm hopeful that there will be some funding to make those changes uh, in the next year or so. Okay. Uh, Mayor Martin, since uh, Brooks is uh, the city of 100 hallows, uh, we have very much different uh, ethnic groups, uh, mainstream, and people from around the world. Uh, how do you see that being an advantage for the city of Brooks? Thank you for the question, Ahmed. Um, I think it's an advantage for our community from two different aspects. One, the cultural diversity in our community, as it is a very young community, uh, community where people have come from a lot of places within Canada from around the world. I think it's an opportunity for people that grew up and live in our community to experience such a different lifestyle in the sense of knowing people from different parts of the world, uh, knowing different cultures, different events. So I think it really has that, that side to it, the social side to it. The other side it brings to us is that in our community we need employees. Uh, so employees that would come to us from across Canada or other parts in the world is what we need in our communities. So there's two parts of it. There's the social and the economic. So both of them, I think, uh, really bring an advantage to our community. Thank you very much. Uh, my second, my question now is both of you. Uh, the last elections have shown that people are not, Canadian are not interested of getting involved with politics. How would you think we can encourage um, Canadians to get involved with the elections and promote the uh, process of the election uh, for so people will be able to get involved, especially the youth. 
in your opinion, Mr. Labar? Oh, thank you, Ahmed. I wasn't sure if you were going to ask <laughs> Martin first. Um, I think it's really important that the youth uh, become involved, and so there's a number of ways to do that. And one of the things that I try to do is I try to go to the, to the junior high schools, to the elementary schools, and to the high schools, uh, and talk to the classes, uh, the social studies classes, where they, they take these programs and uh, talk about uh, Canadian politics. And I try to point out the importance of politics and how it plays a role in their life because it does. Uh, from from the time that uh, you start earning money and uh, paying taxes, then I think it's important that people pay attention to to what the government is doing, the programs that are available, not only uh, from a federal point of view, but there's also the provincial and the municipal as well. Thank you. Uh, Ahmed, that's an uh, interesting question. As you know yourself, you were a candidate in the last municipal election. There was 13 people running for council in Brooks. Four of them were immigrants. Uh, I think in itself that was really great and interesting that, that people are stepping up and running. It is a challenge when people come as an immigrant to be involved. I mean, they're worried about uh, the economics of working to get a job, learn the language, uh, take care of their family. So sometimes that involvement is something that falls away because they've got to take care of, of their own personal life and their family first. So with the challenges of the language often, the politics are something that's hard to connect to, to understand. Uh, as LeVar says, I think through the next generation we're finding the youth have more interest in it as the language is not an issue. And so that's, that's a place, as being connected with the youth, as you say, LeVar, speaking with him. And it's just not the immigrant community in the sense of, of uh, connecting to the election process. It is that 20 to 35 age group of, of all the youth that are here that are finding um, a challenge to be connected to it, uh, their belief that maybe it's not something that's important to them. And I think that is a challenge across, across the whole sector of making that connection. So that's a challenge for us all to get out and involve them, uh, find ways to connect them to committees, find ways for them to have input. I think one of the most interesting things we had uh, this past year, we had a grade six student in their, their government class. There was an issue where he lived in his part of the community and uh, with the encouragement of his school teachers, they came to council and made a presentation about an issue in their, um, where they were living. So. Uh, yes, there are there are good things happening, but yes, you're right. There is a disconnect, and it's a challenge. Yeah, thank you very much. As uh, you mentioned now that yeah, uh, when I ran back 2010 uh, municipal election, right. and uh, that was agreed, and I was proud to say that uh, our community supported uh, largely about the process of that election. The reason that I involved at the time was uh, uh, to open the door for everyone so they can reach the moon. Uh, without giving excuse to themselves that and being uh, playing the victim card. Uh, people can reach, it's a free country, free society, as long as you work hard. And that was the message that I was at the time trying to uh, show the new Canadians. I, s I myself see myself as a new Canadian, been here 24 hours, uh, sorry, 24 years. That's what I say. <laughs> yeah, <it was>. <laughs> <laughs> 24 years, yeah, yeah. pardon me. Uh, and still uh, consider new Canadian. Um, the definition, I believe, is because if you were not born here, you're still an immigrant. So my kids will be a uh, uh, first generation. Uh, they won't be new Canadian. But still, uh, that was the message that time I sent. And great was um, uh, after that, now we have a lot of, of new Canadians uh, that get involved in the polit political process, uh, federally, municipally, and provincially. Uh, last time when I did invite uh, our premier, uh, Madame Alison Redford, when she was running the candidate. And we had a large number of people that uh, new Canadians who show up when she was giving the presentation. Uh, though that uh, she um, uh, very well spoken at the time uh, when she was the candidate. Uh, that shows the engagement of the new Canadians uh, from the part. But a lot of Canadians have um, not they took as granted the freedom, and especially when it comes to the, to the uh, voting system. Uh, where I come from, most of the uh, new immigrants come from is uh, to vote or to 
the process of election is uh, uh, to have yourself be killed. Um, so the freedom that you can vote without being afraid of being killed is a great thing, and, and it's a great thing that most of the Canadians should be aware of. That's the message that we always advocate. But that's a good point. Uh, my second question to Mr. Labar is um, how do you think we could attract investors to Canada? Well, that's an important question, obviously. Uh, and our, I think our government is doing some of that right now. Um, there's a number of ways, of course, is through investment. But through a low tax regime, uh, it allows investors to bring in funds to invest in our country into manufacturing or other enterprises. And we've certainly seen some of that happen and uh, creating jobs through that process. And that is a really major important aspect of our policy is to ensure that the, the tax rates are very, very competitive on a global basis to attract these investors. And so we want to do that on a long term because on a long term, uh, that money that's coming in is going to create more jobs and more opportunities for everyone in, in this country. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, how do you think, Mr. Mayor, to attract investors in uh, a small city like uh, Brooks that's having a good growth now and uh, have uh, uh, with the count of new? Well, that's interesting in the sense when you say small maybe versus a city. What we're finding is that some of the immigrants really enjoy the smaller community is the opportunity to set up a small business. Mm -hmm. Tremendous amount of business sense or business experience from these people in their former countries that they were at. So it's easier for them out of the major cities like Edmonton, Calgary in a sense the, where the expenses are lower to come in and set up a small business. And so we're finding that uh, they're taking those risks and stepping up. But I think it goes back to uh, what the federal government is also doing, what they're attempting to do with their immigration policies. Uh, I think those things that they're changing uh, will contribute to the types of people that can come in and contribute in our communities, both of small businesses, uh, the types of people that we need to get into. So you've changed your policies that I think will help, um, I, in particular, smaller areas, uh, the type of people that they want to attract. My question now is, uh, the, uh, when it comes to the uh, minorities, uh, especially uh, for the uh, conservative, conservative uh, party, um, is there is, uh, the policy promoting within the uh, government, uh, conservative government, as um, supposed to uh, been here for in, in power now for a while? Uh, what do you think is the uh, good track record of the, uh, of the government? Uh, well, all conservative governments that I'm aware of, uh, we were the first ones to certainly hire minorities. Okay, so we're the first one to have a Japanese uh, minister. We're the first one to have a, a black senator. We're, you know, and the, and the yeah. list goes on and on. Okay. And uh, if you look at our caucus, yeah. uh, we have all kinds of different minorities in the caucus and in the ministerial roles as well as the parliamentary secretary roles and as well as women. Um, there's a lot of women that are in those particular roles and importance, and so that's part of our diversification uh, for, for minorities. Oh, that's that's uh, very good to hear. Now coming back to the deficit, uh, how do you think um, our government be able to cut the deficit so our next generation will not end up being the deficit of this generation? At the same time, create jobs. That's a very challenging one. It is challenging, and, and one of the things that we've done, of course, is uh, January 1st this year, the rate for tax has gone down for business as well. So that's one of the opportunities to certainly uh, attract business and attract uh, investment in this country. The other trick is, of course, uh, is it's very important to look at and review every budget within the Government of Canada, and part of that process is ongoing right now. and. We will see the budget come down in uh, late February, early March, uh, and we will see lots of reduction there. Um, I sit on two committees, um, Aboriginal and Northern Affairs, and the Agriculture Committee. And uh, as part of that process, uh, our caucus members are sitting and reviewing the actual expenditures that are happening in these departments, and we can make recommendations on, on those. And um, 
you know, we've just had a, a break here for, for the Christmas break, so we'll be coming back and we'll be working further on those to see where it's going to finally end up. There is a special committee that is sitting as well to review the whole overall uh, expenditures of the Government of Canada, so we're trying to look for opportunities to reduce uh, expenditures. And that's uh, how we're going to be able to reduce that deficit and uh, ensure that uh, we get into the black and pay off the debt. So next generation won't be uh, forced to pay the, the... Well, that's that's certainly the plan, Ahmed. Um, you know, obviously uh, certain things can happen, and yep. we talked earlier about the, the global recession. Yep. Uh, potentially, if that is really devastating, yep. um, that might have to change some of the strategy we're looking at. But uh, for the most part, uh, I believe our Prime Minister and our Finance Minister certainly are looking at how we can get us back into the black and thereby uh, get rid of the debt. That's a good uh, uh, news to hear. Mr. Martin, uh, Brooks being a small city compared to Medicine Hat or Calgary or Edmonton, uh, but uh, has a large number of different ethnic groups and, and mainstream. And some of the challenges that, uh, that we have uh, uh, know that uh, is uh, some of the mainstream uh, don't like to see more immigrants coming. Um, they just want to keep the way the life was, maybe by back then, uh, uh, which there is a valid point when they talk about that discussion uh, because of some of the new immigrants think that they are entitled for something uh, when the people who came never had any entitlement. Uh, and when they came, they go through uh, difficulties and the new people coming here now, they think that they are entitled. So I listen both sides of the aisle, <laughs> I have to be fair. Uh, so uh, uh, having said that, uh, how, do you see th how do you see that two things can be reconciled? Well, Ahmed, you're probably right. You've probably seen both sides of it thoroughly. Um, a couple of different things about Brooks. The average age of Brooks is just over 30, which means that we have a lot of younger people coming and going um, because of the industries. Uh, so there's a lot more acceptance of differences when the younger the population, so that helps us from what you're saying. But what you're talking about is, is the challenges of, of what a past generation you said that when they came was their ESL, was their extra training programs for all this? No, people that came that immigrated, let's say, that remember this in the in the 40s, 50s, 60s, particularly after the Second World War. No, they just had to come and figure it out and survive on their own and make those. So now they're saying, why are all these programs there? Well, the other side of it is we need people to learn that language as quickly as possible so they can gain economic value. To have people in our communities that don't know English really restrains them in, in the economic and employment levels that they can attain. So we would prefer, in a sense of communities, to have those people as successful as possible. You want them to, to get to the jobs that we need filled, and they need those languages. So those ESL training programs that the provincial and federal government help us with, uh, to fund. Those are important so that those people can get to jobs, get more economic value. They then can buy the houses, they can buy the consumer goods. If they stay at that level of, of language that, that is really a barrier, that's difficult. So when you break down those language barriers by providing the training, that provides all sorts of things. Ahmed, you're being here as an inter to do the interview here with the language skills that you have that provides that opportunity for you to do those kinds of things and that's what we need to do. So there are other supports, yes, that weren't there in the 40s and 50s, but I think we've, we need to get past that. Those people who remember this, yes, I understand the concerns they have, but for the future, I think you have the younger generation understanding that we need to change and change is difficult, no doubt, but I think that uh, the reality is the economics and the social sides, we need to have some of those things happen as quickly as possible. I could not agree more, uh, but at the same time, uh, some of the uh, uh, farmers that I met, uh, actually, uh, uh, one of the frustrations as a taxpayer, I myself am um, a taxpayer, and as far, as far as I'm concerned, I am not entitled to anything in life other than what I work for. 
that's, that's my way and that's what I teach my kids. Uh, they are not entitled to anything in life other than hardworking, honest vision, faith, and freedom. Those are the foundation of what you have. Uh, but some of the people might think that um, it might be a good idea to speak also from the language people have to say, okay, this is how far we can help. But what are the responsibilities of the new person as well? Uh, so that is where some of the mainstream that I met have the frustration. Uh, and that's not politically incorrect. Uh, politically correct, we have uh, to speak from the truth that where are the light at the end of the tunnel? There is some sort of discussion that, and that is the same thing what we discussed when Honorable uh, the Federal Minister was in, in Brooks. Um, don't, it's, it's, it is about people have to take responsibility to learn as well. Uh, and, and, and be responsible, personal responsibility is part of, of what we should be encouraging. Well, Ahmed, you're, you're talking on some really important issues, but they're complicated as well. Yeah. Um, complicated in the sense of LeVar works with, with the federal side in the sense of the immigration. Yeah. We have the regular 95% of the people that come the regular routes. Then we have the refugee piece of 95%. And so some of the things that you may be referring to is come specifically because of the refugee population who can come to a great country. They don't have all those things that are required of the 95% of the population immigrants that come that they're required to have a lot of different things. And I know the federal government has looked at changing some of those programs to take into consideration those things that you're mentioning, the language, those skills. But as a, a country that has a long history of accepting refugee population, and in Brooks, we have a significant amount of our immigration population as refugee. So that comes with a whole different number of things that needs to occur because those people haven't had the opportunity to learn the language often before they come or the customs of the country where a regular immigrant has to go through a lot of different things to qualify. So sometimes the issues you're referring to is for that smaller 5% of the population that comes into our country into the refugee class. And in Brooks, that's a large percentage of it. Or the temporary foreign workers is another section of people that come that that's a challenge for. So that's the federal government, the provincial government working together with right. uh, to try to find ways to make it best. And then we in the municipal, municipal level, where they're living in our communities, are often the front line facing the exact issues you're talking about, the community that people are talking about. But again, the federal government I know works with the province trying to get those numbers right, trying to get the classes. And so that's something we stay in communication with. They learn from us what it's at the grassroots level, what's happening, and then try to make the system work. And LeVar, you probably have got some uh, comments about that as well. Well, certainly in Alberta, uh, temporary foreign workers, there's a huge number of temporary foreign workers that come in because there are so many jobs available and then not enough people to, to fill them. Now, having said that, there are a lot of underemployed uh, people here in the country, uh, all, all across the country. So, you know, we have a lot of our First Nations people. We have a lot of people from the Eastern Canada uh, who are not fully employed. And there's opportunities, and hopefully they would be able to come here to Alberta and fill some of those jobs. Sometimes a lot of people don't like some of the jobs that are there. You know, um, everybody's got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. And uh, I know there's a lot of people who would like to get that uh, that big job where they can work at their desk and their computer and and make a hundred grand a year or whatever the number might be um, but sometimes you got to work your way through that and and get there uh, like most of us have done mm -hmm. uh, over the years and uh, as Martin says uh, we do work with the province uh, there's the uh, provincial nomination program so the province has an opportunity to nominate the type of workers that they want and certainly look at the numbers of people that they can bring in under that as well as the temporary foreign workers as well as the regular uh, immigrants and the refugees and certainly the refugees are much more difficult obviously to to get into the country and have them become part of the society because uh, it's really important to to meld into that process without losing your own identity or the identity of your culture uh, those things are important for people who come here to Canada to keep those. And um, 
it's it's a really uh, balancing process to try and get everything working right and so we have to work with uh, as we say with the municipalities and the provinces the employers uh, so it's it's a pretty big job and uh, we're bringing in something like 250,000 uh, immigrants a year into this country so and I think there's about 25,000 refugees uh, that come so there's a, a lot to be done and uh, we need to try and get them into uh, the appropriate programs and uh, get them into the workforce so that they can they can have that opportunity to uh, start their life and uh, contribute to society. I could not agree more and I think I uh, was a few very right about uh, that and proud to say that uh, yeah um, when it comes to refugees yeah Canada was uh, part of the uh, signatories of Geneva Convention and that's obligation from the Canadian side which proud to uh, have to host a lot of refugees from all over the world. And the, the, but the point being uh, talking to the mainstream as well, some of them, is we should be giving the proper education and at the same time proper tools so they will be useful to the society and be productive in the society. And uh, sometimes then that is where it comes to encourage them not only for uh, ESL but also uh, trade or other available that, uh, that we can get so they will be able to help themselves, their family, as well as uh, the, um, the, um, uh, the city or the, the economic cycle of the province and the federal. And that is where some of them uh, had uh, frustration and I always keep telling them that, well, um, not all of them are the same. So each community, they have their own uh, bad apple within. Uh, not any ethnic group that uh, can be blamed for something of uh, of uh, people that you know can make their own uh, views without even knowing. Uh, so it is it's uh, to reconcile the two is is the challenge that uh, that needs to be worked out from the municipality, province, and and federal. It is uh, it's uh, it's it's great. I think um, we're coming to the conclusion of our. Global Village, uh, if you want to say something, Mr. Martin. You bet. One of the things that, you know, uh, the opportunity to sit and do this with LeVar, I appreciate, but also one of the things that LeVar does in our area is get out into our communities. He gets out and meets with the people. He comes to our communities. He listens to the people in our communities. And as a politician like I am, you can't make everybody happy, and the Wheat Board issue is one that I know he hears both sides of. But the thing is, he comes to our communities and meets with people in open houses, individually in groups, and that's very much appreciated. So we appreciate him coming out and listening to the people in our communities. Well, thank you that for that, Martin. Ahmed, it is a pleasure to be here. And as Martin says, I try to meet with everybody I can. Uh, I think as the Member of Parliament for this region, I think it's extremely important to be able to listen to people's issues and concerns and take those back to Ottawa and I try to do that and I, I travel up and down this uh, highway uh, to the various communities uh, discussing the issues with, with people and I'm just really honoured to be the member and uh, really pleased to have this opportunity to be on your show. No, thank you very much both of you. I think uh, I have uh, uh, met uh, many times your involvement of all sectors of the community in our area and that was a great and I think we, we should be continuing that and I hope you will be able to come over there for many months to come and many years to come as always you did and that was a great from your side and thank you very much Mr. Mayor I think I've um, been knowing you for a very long time as a friend and Mr. Labar as a friend and thank you very much for coming to the Global Village show first day and I hope to see you and we invite you next time. I hope you will be able to come over again. Okay, thank, thank you. Very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Martin. Yeah, this is uh, the uh, conclusion of the uh, first day of Global Love Village uh, show with um, Show Cable. And all our listeners, thank you very much for watching the program. And we hope you will join us next time. Until then, this is Ahmed Kassim, your host of Global Village show in Medicine Act. Thank you and have a good day.